This week's episode of the Inside Running Podcast is sponsored by Mizuno. Tune in later as we review the all-new Neo Collection, driven by performance, inspired by nature. Be sure to check out all of the latest updates from Mizuno at mizuno.com.au or you can find them in selected stores. Welcome to episode 259 of the Inside Running Podcast. As you've probably guessed, there's no Brady this week. He's busy sandbagging Moema Bowling Club and Achuka Kia. Uh, but all jokes aside, they're doing it pretty tough down there with the floods, as well as other parts of Victoria, New South Wales and Tasmania. So our thoughts go out to those in the flood-affected parts of the country. Uh, but the show must go on, so we'll have all the usual segments, as well as a special guest host. Uh, before we reveal Brady's replacement, I'd like to welcome the man who finished 61st at this year's Victorian 10K Road Champs and regular co-host, Julian the Big Moose Spence. How are you, Moose? Mate, you suck at this. <laughs> well, You're actually terrible at pump up. Well, Brady, Brady keeps using the same intro week in, week out, so I thought I'd it's dig right. a little... No, one, thought, no one's upset about that. I thought I'd dig... Well, it sounds like you are. <laughs> Um, so I thought I'd dig a bit deeper and let the listeners know a few other of your achievements. Oh, so, you, could have gone, you could have gone back and embarrassed me a bit further. Well, I was going to yeah. use I was going to say that you're a 67 half marathon man from the Gold Coast in 2019, but then you would have turned that around to saying, "Well, my half marathon to marathon conversion is pretty good." Mm, I could have. <laughs> yeah, that 10k. I think I was the leading scorer in Division Four. <laughs> Uh, so, so just wanted to sort of captain the team that day. I really just wanted to see what reaction I'd get out of you. That's all. So um, yeah, upset. How you how you been, mate? Had a bit of bit of rain down there. Oh yeah, we had the rain, uh, but nothing like I'm not complaining because there are literal like towns underwater. So yes, it rained a lot, um, but the the town down here or the council have they looked ahead of time and the river slash uh, swamp that um, we live next to is probably 100 metres away from our house. That that's that doesn't have a drainage point. So, like, it's not a natural river. It's more like a swamp. Um, and so it's been sort of carved into a bit of a river. It looks quite nice. But if it rains a lot, it fills up and, and it can flood. So ahead of time, the, um, the town dug out a... They get bobcats or whatever down on the um, beach and they dig out a, a, like a, a valve for it. And so when it starts raining, it just um, we get a river mouth basically. Mm. So there, it's, it's quite well managed in that regard. And, um, yeah, Geelong obviously flooded on the river, but I don't, I don't think there were many any homes in Geelong that suffered that bad, maybe just like one or two. So, yeah, we sort of you were seeing what's happening up mm. north and it's pretty rough yeah and we should give like, i've had a fair few people message in just asking like how brady's going and um brady and the family and the house are all okay at the moment um because he's on the moama side but uh, it's a nervous couple of days just because the murray um is still sort of uh climbing um but at, the, at this stage he's uh he's doing okay so um uh, moose how are you feeling about the next nine weeks without brady Mm, well, so far you've done all right. This agenda is looking okay. Yeah. I, it's going to. I reckon I'm going to have to talk a bit more, which I'm not looking forward to that much. So, yeah. No, we just we just get the guest the guest host. They just have yeah. to step up. And we we just pump them full of questions. They're going to carry the weight tonight. 
But a few things, I, I listened to Road to Valencia episode one last week, and how about him going on about how he was booted off the main show? Like, oh. that was that was purely a captain's call. He just went, boys, I'm out of here. And I'm, I'm trying to work out why he didn't want to – didn't want to be on here with us anymore and I wonder if it's because he's sick of sick of hearing our ordinary weekly recaps where it's like ne- neither is race trained very well and he thought I'm going to go over and um, talk running with some guys that are actually running well yeah that's it's definitely a more uh, elite podcast <laughs> in terms of the running we're talking about because even the guests we've got on tonight's pretty average to be honest pretty average chat about running right now yeah, I don't know. Well, let's inter- up to. Yeah, let's introduce this guest. Uh, she's a Tokyo Olympian and the fifth fastest Australian female of all time over the ten thousand meters. Welcome back to the Inside Running podcast, Ellie Pashley. Yeah, it's thanks, fourth. guys. Ellie, good, Ellie, it's fourth, isn't it? Fourth. I think it's fifth because no fifth. Rose yeah. knocked me off. Yeah, because Rose had that one, and this is interesting, actually. I, I did some research before tonight's show, and on the Australian rankings, Rose still has that 30-50-odd, where, remember, she ran a lap short, um, or yeah. they timed her when she still had a lap to go. I think she, yeah, anyway. But then this year, when she qualified for Worlds, she ran 31-18 low, I think it was. And so, she, yeah, she just just got you on that one. Oh, but fifth, right. fifth, yeah, so fifth's pretty good though. I'd take fifth all the time. Yeah, I, I feel uh, I feel like that's a very distant memory. That 10k, I'm a, a long, long way off that at the moment. How uh, but, how is mum life treating you? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, so far so good. So Tiggy's four months old, and yeah, getting back into some running now, which is nice. Yeah, well, I've got a few questions for you, but maybe uh, do you want to run us through your training week? I've I've looked at your Strava, and based on your Strava, you're a Sunday specialist. The last two weeks, you've only uploaded Sundays, um, but hopefully there's a few more extra runs in there. Yeah, yeah, I went pretty quiet on Strava over the last uh, 12 months, I think. once When I was pregnant, there wasn't much happening, so I went off it, and then, yeah, I'm only just easing back into it now, so um yeah I'll go through my week this week so I ran on Monday just 6k out and back in Aries oh I'll just I'll give you a bit of a rundown of where I'm at at the moment so I started running again at about uh six weeks after I had Tiggy I started doing some walk jogging and then um basically start built back up hurt my back so I had a couple of weeks off with that and then I've sort of built back up again now so last week was actually the first week that I ran every day um since then Uh, maybe even yeah since I got back into running at all so uh, Monday just 6k easy on Tuesday I uh, I've I'd been feeling really good the week before so I thought I'll just sort of start testing my body again with some steady running so I did four by three minutes steady two minutes easy um and that was just out and back from home again and my three minute reps were wildly unimpressive (laughs) (laughs) they were uh 358 403 335 and then 342 but the 335 was downhill so I was going uphill for the first two and then downhill for the second two um but yeah that was good that was the first time I'd sort of run a little bit faster since since I'd come back from the back injury and I felt really good heart rate through the roof but uh legs and muscular system felt good you weren't running to heart rate you're just running purely to feel yeah, I just thought I had my heart rate on, so I used that as a bit of a guide to pull back if I it got too high, which, yeah, like it jumped up to threshold really quickly in those three-minute reps. Um, but, yeah, essentially it's all just effort-based stuff at the moment, and my perception of effort is completely gone out the window. So, um, yeah, I, I feel quite good running at those paces, and then I look down at my heart rate and it's, through the roof so I guess that's just yeah it's it's a good point you make though I've got a question though for both of you do you you think that heart rate sometimes when you're first coming back 
is isn't always a great guide because as you said like perceived effort felt pretty good but your heart rate's through the roof and i know personally if i'm coming back and i'm not very fit my heart rate will hit you know say 170 but i could i could talk during it whereas when i'm fit and i hit 170 i'm in a i'm in completely different level of pain do you find that uh i don't think i could have talked during these to be honest i yeah i i I know what you mean but i like you mechanically it feels for me what i find is mechanically i feel fine because my body sort of knows how to run at those at that rhythm Mm. but my heart rate's really high and i'm but i get uh I can get myself into a hole really quickly. Like the first rep, I'll think, oh, yeah, this is fine. This is pretty easy, even though my heart rate got up to like 173 in the first three minutes. Um, But then each rep gets progressively harder. And then my heart rate doesn't come down in between anywhere near as much towards the end. And that was only, you know, 20 minutes worth of running. Um, But, yeah. What about you, Moose? Do you, yeah. do you find you can get your heart rate a lot higher for a pretty low perceived effort when you're not that fit? Uh, I I think the effort's not too different, but I know I can get it higher when I'm not fit. Um, so even like for an easy day, like it, it gets higher um, quicker, obviously, because you're not as fit, but it, it still feels pretty hard to me. But I think it's more on the workouts where, say I'm doing reps like a um, – Say I do eight four hundreds or something, and I'm just running to pace. At the very end, when I'm at the very end, when I look at my heart rate, it gets way higher than what it would normally. I, I, I feel like you can find a new max heart rate when you're not fit. Yeah, yeah. So does that mean because you, you because you get your heart rate up a fair bit higher than you could if you were fully fit? Does that mean that you can do your easy runs at a slightly higher heart rate when you're first coming back? Yeah. Than, than you can when you're fit. I think I think so. Yeah. I always, I hope so. I always yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the mileage is low, the the stress is kind of less, I guess. Um, but I, I, I think that um, I think that you give. I always give myself an extra like five to ten beats when I'm not fit on easy days, mm. because it just seems like it, maybe I go from one forty being a, a so, like a, a bit of a ceiling that I aim for on the flat on easy days maybe I push that up to 145 to 150 when I'm not, when I'm coming back like the first month. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Good, you're good right. Job. When your mileage is so low. Yeah. It's kind of hard to do a 6k run, keeping your heart rate below 140 when you've got no fatigue in your legs. Yeah. Or anything, but, mm. um, yep. So then that was Tuesday. I've been doing some bike as well, just to top up my running while my mileage is still being low, but, yeah, that's um, sort of gradually reducing so me that bike. I'm running more. No, um, <laughs> yeah, a I bit t- of that. I don't I t- really count that though. I take it you're not. I take it you're not <laughs> setting her program at the moment, Moose. No, because I've seen what her, her bike rides are. They're like ride with a group of old ladies on electric bikes to different clubs <laughs> around town. The pussy peddlers. <laughs> <laughs> that's my bike gang in Aries. Tell them about yeah. the bike gang. What's the demographic? I'm the youngest by quite a way, but I'll tell you what, these ladies are way more fun than me. They have drinks after every bike ride. I'm always the first one to go home. They are, yeah, they're pretty fun. So we do, well, at the moment I haven't been able to join as much because of Tiggy, but, yeah, we do Friday Arvo bike rides and drinks. Um, Anyway. <laughs> Wednesday, 7K, just loop around Aries, five-minute pace. Uh, Thursday, another 7K, just out and back, 4.35s. This was probably me getting a bit antsy again (laughs) with my low mileage. That's probably a bit quick for me at the moment. And then on Friday, I ran with Jordan, who's one of our friends who lives in Mogs. So we did... 10 and a half K and we did seven K easy first. And then I wanted to do a three K um, progression. So we did a loop around Mogs Creek over the back and then did, and he he wanted to know what pace I wanted to run. And I just said, no pace. This is just effort. I'll just gradually pick it up as I go. And you can just run with me if you want or run off ahead if you want to. Um, 
but that ended up being yeah 7k probably about 445s into four minutes 353 and then 329 for the last k and 329 heart rate was got up to 180 which is pretty high for me was that flat on the flat or were you running downhill yeah that was on the flat or the the first 2k were actually downhill and then the last k was on the flat we just did a loop around this um little block in town so yeah good kick, good kick down <laughs> yeah. I was full sprinting by the end that's what it felt like um but yeah that was I just said to Jordan at the end oh that's just so fun to like hurt a little bit again so that was good and then is it is it, is it scary knowing that you're all out for 1k is what your marathon, well, the marathon pace, pace. Is going to need to be yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was pre- it's pretty crazy like the effort level for that knowing that that was once marathon pace but yeah that's okay it's the the fun thing at the moment is that every week you get fitter so like you, I was doing I think just before I hurt my back I did a 3k pickup and I think the fastest I got was 350 and that felt like what the 330 felt like the other day so there's progress. You just can't look at um, what you used to do. Mm. And then Saturday morning, I just did 8K, 455s. And then Sunday, I ran with the group. So I was planning on running 16 to 18K. And I got a bit lost on the way home and did 19.4. Um, but yeah, that was fun again, running with everybody. We just did a loop around Anglesey. 449 average probably threshold heart rate average trying to keep up with the boys but um you say yeah. you say that though but at one point you were the one who was pressing the pace back up Elkington Road um and then I thought gee she must be going all right but then coming back and looking at your heart rate I'm thinking why would you be the one pressing the pace when your heart rate is so hot <laughs> yeah again like there's a fair loss of uh <laughs> perception of effort and I said that to Jimmy actually just after we went up Elkington um my heart rate was like 176 or something <laughs> running up that hill um but yeah and that's I, I where think, you're, but that's where you're pressing them that's the bit yeah no I wasn't pressing I was just trying to hang on <laughs> um yeah so I'm pretty much I'm sort of I, like Sundays are going to be a hard day no matter what for the next few months so I'm just trying to between like Tuesday Friday and Sunday if they're my highest stress days I'm going to just try and keep it really short and cruisy in between and then um, I'll get Jules to take over coaching me in the next couple of weeks if he's happy to do that again Um, but that was 69k for the week so biggest Mm. week since I had Tiggy and feeling good. Nice. I've uh, I've written down a few questions here. I might start with the big one that I guess everyone wants to know. Like, have you and Moose sat down and sort of looked at some long-term goals within the next six to 12 months? Nah, not really. I I sort of – I'm wary of um, putting races like or race goals in place because I'm just worried that I'll try and do too much too soon if I've got a – time on it if that makes sense yeah so yeah not not really I think the plan well we probably haven't even really talked about the plan at all but in my head anyway um I just sort of want to get fit first and then I might start doing some local low-key races over the next couple of months and then um pick a marathon next year but I'd love to do one in the first half of the year, but I'm just not sure, like Jules and I have discussed this, I'm just not sure if that's a little bit too soon. I don't think I'm going to be fit by March, April. Um, but, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens over the next couple of months, but it's probably more likely going to be second half of the year, I'd say. Which would rule out so world, world champs next year then? Yeah, I, I just don't think I'm going to get fit enough to run the time required to make the team, yeah. like, when I'd, I'd have to basically do it in March, April, because I think World Champs is August. Um, and I just, yeah, I can't see. I'm not somebody that gets fit really quickly. It's, it takes me a while. And I think just with such a big chunk of time out um, to get that base 
uh, and then do a marathon top of a marathon block on top of that. I, I think I'll just need a little bit more time, but like we'll we'll see what happens over the next couple of months. Any comments, Moose? Uh, I think I think you'll be surprised how fit you get quickly. Uh, like although you have a lot of time out, you also had a lot of good years where you were doing decent mileage, where you got in five or six marathon preps. Mm. I think it'll come back really quickly. But the last time that we were chatting about which marathon to do was in the middle of like a three week block where you weren't running because your back was fucked, and so it's. It's hard to make plans when you're not running at all um, and you have a pretty debilitating injury. So it's like now's probably a chance where we can discuss what to do. But I like what you said. Like if you put a race on the cards, all of a sudden you start rushing, rushing for it to a degree and you start ignoring niggles and you start sort of forcing workouts and um, pushing mileage where maybe it's not the best idea. There's a long time to go in your career and you don't have to run every championships. Mm. But I think you will surprise yourself with how quick, with how fit you get quickly. So chasing like a 10K in terms of like trying to get points for a roll down for world champs, not an option? Because what's the oh. qualifying What's the qualifying now? It's like 30. The qualifying time's really fast now, 30-something, 30. 30-50 yeah. maybe, is it, for the women? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Look, I don't. Yeah. I. I the, watching the ten k's in the last couple of championships. I just. Yeah. I don't think. <laughs> it. It's sort of changed. I reckon in the last couple of years, and the the girls are just running so fast that it's you're just not in the race mm. if you're. Yeah. I. I don't think I'm really a ten k runner anyway, to be honest. But um. No. Nah, I think like my thought process is try and do. Uh, you know, like hilly local fun runs through summer, maybe a little bit of track if Jules makes me, which he probably will. Um, and yeah, pro- and just focus on marathons as Paris. the main goal for yeah. next year. Make, make Paris Paris the uh, priority. Yeah, I'd, that's like obviously the big end goal. But yeah, I mean that team's going to be a really really hard team to make, which which is good. I think it, it's watching what's happened in the last 12 months with the girls and how fast they've been running the marathon it's I'm feeling really really motivated and I'm trying to just yeah not not do anything stupid because I I am feeling <laughs> probably a bit too motivated at the moment but um yeah it, I think it's good I think it's going to drive everybody to try and run really fast over the next 12 months or so yeah and actually that was one of my question uh, questions was what's it been like being on the sidelines watching Jess win com games gold and Lisa run 224 in Berlin is it sort of is it part sort of frustrating that you couldn't be out there or is it sort of motivated you which you, you did say it has motivated you yeah no like it's actually been to be honest really fun to watch and and really motivating um like it it does it makes when you see what the girls are doing it it makes you think oh well you know that's that's what I'm gonna have to do if I want to make teams from now on and and I think that's good for me I need that sort of pressure almost Mm -hmm. um probably the one thing was I was I would have loved to have run a marathon like after the Olympics I would have loved to have run a fast flat um cold marathon just because I I felt like I was I was quite fit and I just didn't get time to squeeze that in um before having a baby but that I mean again that's more fuel and more motivation to try and do it now so mm. yeah and yeah. I was gonna, sorry you go moose I'm holding it do you have any uh, uh trouble comparing yourself to other ladies who had babies around the same time or even in this in the past like seeing uh who was the triathlete that won the the, the, the Kona chick who uh, had Chelsea Sodaro yeah. yeah, so what was it, 18 months ago, she's winning Kona. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, like, um, celebration around that about when someone performs really well quickly after pregnancy. Is that hard not to get sucked into? Uh, no, nah, not really. Like, I I think I know my own body pretty well and, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to, to – I'm not a – you know, I'm not somebody, I'm not going to be willing to wait like two years and take it really, really slow, but I'm also not in a real rush. I'm happy to just sort of go week by week and um, 
see what I can cope with, what I can tolerate, because it's all going to be new as well from now on, like juggling everything. So, yeah, I'm I'm not – I don't really feel pressure or um, – I guess I'm not really comparing myself to other people that have had a baby at the same time because there are a few of us at the moment. I'm happy to just, yeah, do it at my own pace. And I think, you know, everybody's different. And mm. it's uh, to me it's not really worth, re- like, spending the next 12 months injured if I go too hard too soon. So I'm, yeah, just going to go week by week. But, it's I mean, that's it's also motivating to see what people can do so soon after. Like that um, Kona... Chelsea the girl that won that was that was insane and I'd actually watched some YouTube videos about her when I was pregnant I was telling Brie this the other day Jules um and it was her when she was trying to come back to racing and her goal was you know getting to Kona and potentially winning and I remember watching those videos thinking oh like she's not going really really good here there's a lot of you know a lot of injuries and setbacks and I was Mm. thinking I don't know if she's going to be able to do it and then yeah sure enough 18 months later here she is yeah so that's cool you can follow that yeah hey um Ellie has it been more challenging to get fit post-pregnancy than you thought it would be uh to be honest the running like I actually felt better running than I thought I would initially and I felt like in the first few weeks uh things were coming back more quickly than I expected but then what I've noticed is my body is just nowhere near as resilient. So like little probably weaknesses and things that I, uh, asymmetries that I used to get away with now, like my body is just so much weaker that I notice those little niggles and little sore spots that I'd had in the past and that they just went away. They, they then turned into, yeah, like a nasty (laughs) back injury. So it's been, like the running feels okay, but I just, I think my body's probably not as resilient at the moment. And it's been a really good kick in the butt to do strength stuff. And cause I was actually quite diligent with that until I started running. And then as I did more Ks, I got a bit slack on the strength. And as soon as I got slack on the strength, I hurt myself. So um, yeah, I think, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge. I think I've actually got a lot stronger in the last few weeks, but I'm going to have to keep that up because yeah, I think, and I like I had a C-section as well, so I, I think that's probably part of it. I've lost a lot of abdominal strength and it's probably going to take a while to get that back. Mm, yeah. And uh, last one from me is, has your perspective on running changed since becoming a mum? And the only reason I ask that is I know since becoming a dad, like when when I was single or even when I was just married and no kids, it's like running was, you know, pretty high on my priority list and then you become a parent and you realize sort of how insignificant running is um has like has your perspective on running changed at all uh a little like it's still pretty early days so it's it's hard to know and obviously yeah like it's not my number one priority in Mm. life anymore and it's always gonna come second but yeah, I, I still, like, I love it just as much as before and I think I probably appreciate it even more now because it's so much more enjoyable going for a run when it's, like, my time each day where I'm by myself and, yeah, mm-hmm. a time to switch off, I guess, from being a mum and, yeah, I, like, I, you know, it doesn't, whatever the weather's doing, it doesn't bother me. I just absolutely love getting outside and running and yeah and I'm like I said earlier I'm feeling really motivated so uh, yeah it's it's not my top priority in life anymore but like I don't think my passion for it has changed at all I always I always feel or felt like you were pretty chilled out about your running anyway like you know it, it was like it was more like you were well even when um we first heard your story how it was you're sort of like you know, a bit more of a recreational runner. It wasn't everything. And so I've always felt like you've been pretty relaxed about the running anyway, compared to maybe some of the other girls that you race against. Yeah, maybe. I probably changed though and became more intense about it, I'd say. But yeah. Is that because of Julian? (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. I had to deal with the repercussions of that intensity. (laughs) 
the crazy, <laughs> the, the crazy bitch phase. <laughs> uh, I'm back. Did you wait a <laughs> couple of weeks? <laughs> well, never well, left, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You've, you've got to get over the top of Toby now. What do you, what do you think about this this bromance? I know, yeah. He's you were to, you were top dog. To you got steal to steal my uh, <laughs> steal my ranking. Um, yeah, I don't know. Jules has been riding with him and all sorts of things, so I've got a bit of work to do. Yeah, Toby's more glory. psycho That's... than me, though. I listen to Road to Valencia. He's yeah, he's, he's definitely crazy. golden. He's definitely golden child at the moment. He anyway, is, yeah. Moose, do you want to talk us through your week? Yeah, well, it wasn't it wasn't that impressive, but it was the biggest week that I've done since March, I think it was. So that that was pretty good. Um, on Monday, I actually it was a it was a beautiful day. So I drove up and parked at the Umrail Scout Camp and did a new loop because I couldn't I didn't want to waste such a good day just running from home. So this is only like five minutes away but it takes out some of the um, trail that I would have to go on to get there so I can go a bit further out. It was a pretty good loop, actually, about 45 minutes. It would be nice if it, if I could add on a K somewhere, I reckon, but I couldn't quite find the best, like the right loop to add on. Um, Did you get in trouble running through the camp? No, uh, well, I no, I, I hooked left before I actually reached the um, – before I reached the entrance. And so I just ran down some boundary roads. Like, no one's out there. I didn't run through the gates or anything. It looks like I – it kind of looked no, – Yeah, I saw the back. map and I thought you had run through past the guy's house. No, so the, the little squiggle down the bottom, that's me going out and back to the gate. And then that left-hand turn, that's actually on um, the road. That's near the power line track where Brett had his accident, like the electrocution happened. That's oh, yeah. pretty much on that little trail there. Um, but, yeah, it's a good loop. I'll do it again. Uh, Tuesday, just, again, another, like, 45 minutes. I'm starting to increase the volume a little bit. I did a workout Wednesday. I'm on a fart, like, I ran um, – no, I didn't. That was later. I did the threshold mix, so – 10 minutes, then eight minutes, then six minutes um, in the new shoes that I had. And they were um, a little bit small, actually. So I started to feel – I knew that was too small at the start. And I thought, oh, let's see if I can get away with this. Um, I had sore toes for probably three days afterwards just from jamming at the end. Um, but the threshold, it went okay. So the first the first um, 10 minutes I did at 3.30 pace, it was it – was, it was uphill. Um, I didn't I mean the average heart rate for the rep was 160, and I don't think I went over like 171. So um, it, it it was it's just a normal 10 minute rep. Like I wonder if it would be better to in order to get these workouts a little more accurate, almost do like a a little float beforehand to get your heart rate out, and then you jump into the rep while we've already got that little heart rate increase, mm. but I don't think it matters. Yeah, it's <laughs> uh, hard to get the effort right often in the first rep, isn't it, of a the, broken The effort threshold. was pretty hard. Yeah, the effort was hard, but the pace and the heart rate wasn't. Mm. So, yeah, it's, I didn't. We had the same discussion on Tuesday. I was doing six-minute reps, and the first rep always feels the hardest, like from a breathing. It's almost like you just the warm-up's not solid enough, like you haven't primed the system. Yes, mm. And I haven't been really – I haven't been doing many strides or anything. I just kind of get changed, maybe do one or two tiny strides, but doing a longer rep stride might be the answer. So yeah. sort of doing two or three-minute, like, long effort, then jump in. Uh, just a sh shuffle slash jog in between, then I did eight minutes, but I turned around, so it was pretty downhill for the eight minutes, three seventeens. Uh, the heart rate was up closer to under threshold for this one. And then six minutes at the end, 323s, that was that was bang on threshold. So just a 24 minutes worth of um, threshold work. Really, it was quite easy, like nothing difficult about that, which is what I wanted. And then later what in shoes? the week, oh, I can't mm. say what shoes. Okay. Um, they're, they're, Miz they're a Mizuno shoe, but I can't tell you what it is because uh, there's like an embargo on it. Okay. 
They're good yeah. though. They're good. <laughs> They're good. They are good. Uh, Wednesday, Arvo, we started getting the rain, and then Thursday it came down. So Wednesday night, pissed rain, and um, actually Bree got sick that that Wednesday night and woke up with like gastro, so symptoms throwing up and. Um, I uh, went up to, to wake Pia and she was actually laying in like a puddle of her own vomit and there was projectile vomit all over the wall and everything. Mm-hmm. That it sort of, <laughs> the, the room stunk. Like I walked in, I'm like, oh no. And the, the, it had run down the wall and into the carpet. And so, yeah, it was pretty nasty. But she was like lying there just sound asleep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I don't get it. Like that would normally wake someone up. <laughs> But that was a day that I spent at home because um, Pia was okay after that, but Bree was really sick. So just um, the, the the rain was bad. So I actually ran on the treaty for 9K. The Nets um, had played that morning maybe or the day before, so I just watched in the preseason. There, jogged the next day, 10K, and then did a workout Saturday morning. So I did a monophyllic and um, – did the out and back. So the way – have you ever done it like this, Croaks, where you mm. go out 10, turn around? Yeah, so um, we all sim- – yeah, so when I was being coached by Ken Green in Sydney, we used to do a fair few sessions like that. We used to also do like, a session like two times 10-minute reps, and wherever you got to on the 10-minute rep, that's where you would start. And so the faster guys would then be chasing the – the slower guys down on the second half. So, yeah, I don't know if I've done it with Mona because we just had a loop we did for Mona, but I've definitely done it like a two by 10 minute rep out and back. Yeah. So, the first time I did it like this, it was actually when I was just started running and I went to a group in Geelong and Troopy showed up and he kind of took it. He didn't do the workout, but he, um, like, oh, this is where you do the, the fart look from. Um, out and back from the Breakwater Bridge down towards like Barwon Valley, the Mad Mile. And it was a group of us. I think there was probably six or six to eight people. And if you turn around after the second one minute jog, then that's the 10 minute mark. And then because it's a group doing it, (laughs) you know, you, you might pass someone or you might get passed on the way back to the start point. And so you can really judge who's gone out too hard and who sandbagged it and is finishing <laughs> like 300 metres past the start point. Um, so the goal, like if you do it perfectly, the goal is to finish at the, the exact point you started or maybe a little bit past. Uh, you could but, really go through all the people you know, couldn't you, and say with, whether they'd finished before yeah. or Exactly. After. Yeah. You, you, you know, <laughs> you can pick train. it out before they start. Um, I, I, I was How'd you pretty, go? I was dumb. So I would like <laughs> – it was a record to see how far down the, the river I could get before I turned around. Um, so it made life real difficult trying to get back oh. to the start line. So, yeah. Whereas some people, you're like, they were dropped off in the first 90 seconds when they should be right next to you. And then you turn around and they're like a minute back up the road. You're like, oh, you all of a sudden they start running faster than you are. Um, that's a sandbag effort. But that was that was yeah. So I, this was all right. I think I actually because it was up and down. I went up the hill, then down the hill. I finished thirty seconds past. Mm. But the reps were pretty good. Like I think it, a sign of a good mono for me, if someone running it properly, is is polarized or like is is a decent distance between ons and offs. Um, so I would prefer someone doing a mono to have at least ten seconds difference between an on and an off. Um, the longer reps. You'll, you'll have a bigger gap, I think. Yeah, that's, so, why, that's yeah. why I reckon with, when you're talking about the out and back, I reckon there's a tendency to run the second half probably a bit more, uh, like a bit harder because when you, once you're into the 30s and the 15s, like it's very hard to back right off. Like you sort of just keep sort of rolling a bit more. Whereas yeah. like when you've got like a minute and a half float, you can you definitely sort of dial back the effort a, a, a bit more, I think. Yeah. yeah, like well, Jules, your yeah. floats. Well, they're always a bit inaccurate when it's that short, but your floats are like three eighteen. Three eighteen. Three thirty. Oh, at the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Back, the, at the yeah, end, fifteen you're seconds. You're running for is home. Yeah. 
yeah. But um, there was still a big change of pace, though. You were running under three minute case for your ons. Yeah, well, on some of some of them. Um, but it's uh, the way it happens in Ballarat is because it's always done on the lake, and there's a fartlek start point. It's really it's it's pretty funny. There's there's a place where you start the fartlek workout, which is in a different place where you start the K reps workout, which is in like a different place where you start like just threshold running. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's really, and this is all within like 50 meters of each other. So the fartlek point is by the time you get to um, like 15 minutes in, you start thinking about how fast your lake time will be. And so the the last three to four minutes is just flat out like what can I make my, how quick can I go through the lake? And so no one ever really breaks down. Like the 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off turns into 60 seconds on, 60 seconds on, 60 <laughs> seconds on. <laughs> yeah. It's just full on tempo. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I reached straight in for that. Then um, the next day, did my longest long run, which was fun. So I went out with the group. Great loop, this one. Nearly 20k. Fantastic loop that I made. Um, everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> the only time he says it's a great loop is when he makes it. Every any time anybody else makes it, there's just complaint after complaint. Yeah. Even if it's a it, shit loop, it's a good one if Julian's uh, yeah. done it. Eh? <laughs> we did go up a staircase. And it's a pretty, pretty tough staircase. Like it's not a staircase is in, it's a rock staircase. So a really steep pinch that they have to put rocks into steps to make it passable. Um, and so Jimmy friend was, he, for some <laughs> people don't think smart. He was like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll lead us up the stairs. <laughs> this is 85. No, how much does he weigh? Ellie? Oh, I don't know, but he's like six foot five or something, isn't he? Yeah, he's a big dude. And I'm thinking, you don't want to be out the front. <laughs> you want to disappear out the back and then have a few little walk breaks. But uh, we had the pressure on him early just to say, no walking, Jimmy. Like two feet off the ground at any given time. And uh, he did well. He got up the top, ruined his He nearly run. fell on me, though. Did you see that? <laughs> so he went he went up at one of the steps and then had no momentum and nearly came backwards. <laughs> I was right behind him, like, trying to keep up, and he nearly tipped back on me. It was quite funny. You had a big redwood falling back on you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, anyway, that was it. It was good. good week. I think I ran um, 82K, so that's, that's, that's good. We're getting there. We're getting there. I've never hey. got you already. No, but you don't have me, so <laughs> wait until it happens. Uh, Ellie, are you writing Moose's program? And second part of the question is, what do you? What are your thoughts on his running at the moment? Like, where should he be heading? What's you know? He seems he seems a bit lost. Mm, so I'm not coaching Jules anymore. He's uncoachable. Um, <laughs> But I actually think what he's doing is good. Like he's, if you look at his bars on Strava, he's ever so gradually creeping up. Mm. Um, I think if he can sort of keep going with this and get up to, even if he can, you know, get up to 120 Ks a week or something, he'll get really fit. Yeah. And, well, I mean, he's already pretty fit considering what he's been doing. Um, but, yeah, if he can keep that knee happy, whilst getting mileage up a little higher, I think he'll notice a big jump in his fitness. But, yeah. like and I think you going to start coaching him again? No, I don't think I don't think he wants me to. Ooh. <laughs> I'm a, Brad, I'm a pretty good coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then I, I reckon I could find an episode where you actually admitted that you needed somebody to coach you. Yeah, but then I realised yeah. I was getting a lot of co- cut and paste. One morning I woke up and I'm like, <laughs> looked at Strava and I'm thinking, fuck, eight other blokes have the same workout as me today. <laughs> oh, so, so, it's, so it's, it's, Mo- it's Moose not feeling, not feeling special enough. <laughs> <laughs> that is bullshit. No, he, um, <laughs> like, I don't know if you're a bit like me, Jules, too, where, you know, once it's written there, you feel like you have to do it and probably with your body, yeah, it's just, you're better off going. Oh yeah, no, nah, today I need to do this. I need an extra day of jogging before I do a session, or I need a day off today without that 
pressure as well? Def- definitely not. My running is not about me getting fit right now. It's about exactly just doing as much as I can safely. And this isn't like a tendon or anything, my knee. I am kind of just have to find the point where it can't handle anymore. Yeah. Um, and before, yeah, it's a bit different to normal. It's sort of, it's going to be a chronic thing forever. So I, I, I do, like even today, running 20K yesterday, today, I'm like, yeah, I can feel it today. I, I probably need to um, take some Nurofen. <laughs> That'll be I was going to say have a day off. <laughs> no, yeah. take drugs. No, do the Nurofen first. <laughs> take some prednisolone. <laughs> no, no, we don't do that. That's sales art. That, that's, that's, no, uh, prednisolone's not illegal. I know, but that's strong. part of the thing over there that they like, we're taking it too often. The grey area. The grey area, exactly. We don't do that, Ali. Come on. <laughs> All right. Okay. Do you want to hear about my ordinary week? Yeah, yeah um, I would yeah, love to. We do. All right. So I did an hour on Monday. Uh, I ran from home just because of all the rain that we'd had. Um, I thought it would be more enjoyable running on the bike path than it would be running through puddles at Mulligan. So hour at 410s. Uh, I didn't feel too bad, actually. Like, I don't know about you guys, but – Sometimes I feel really good on a Monday after a Sunday long run. I don't know if it's because mentally going back to, say, an hour after you've been out for two, two and a half on the Sunday, you're like, oh, this is this is easy compared to what I've done the day before. But for some reason, Mondays are one of my better days in terms of how I feel. Um, don't know if you guys yeah. experienced that. Yeah, uh, I reckon. No. <laughs> I often feel better by the end of the run too. Yeah. yeah. Like you find and you sometimes you're a little bit stiff at the start and then – by the end, you feel good? Yes. So that was Monday. Tuesday, I met um, Liam and Rob, a couple of guys that I coach out at Thoroughbred Park, so the, the horse racing track. Um, there's a yeah, a gravel, it's 1,800 metres around. It's just inside the main racing um, track, and it's, yeah, it's just this crushed gravel, really good surface. Like one half of the track's like slightly uphill, the other half's slightly downhill. So the session was five times six minutes, uh, one minute sort of standing recovery. So I was getting pretty much like exactly like one lap in or, um, you know, I'd get through one lap and have maybe five seconds to go. Uh, so for this, uh, I went 322, 321, 321, 318, 316. I wore the heart rate monitor and the benefit I got from wearing the heart rate monitor here was on the the last 90 seconds was slightly uphill and slightly into a headwind. So if I didn't have the heart rate strap, I'd probably just be trying to roll the same sort of pace. Whereas, you know, the heart rate was obviously tr- would start to creep up there. So and I knew sort of 170 was really where I didn't want to go above. So I would almost just slow down so that it wouldn't go above 170. Um, so it, it was an okay session. Like I. Yeah, like the paces aren't anything special. Like maybe the gravel is worth a second or two a K compared to like bike path or track, but um, it was okay. Got it, got it done. Were you with the group What's doing your... it? Oh, so we um we all we started all the reps together. So those guys were running more like three thirty, like three thirties to three thirty fives. So I'd be a little bit ahead on the rep, and then we'd sort of regroup and start from the same point each time. Yeah, so that's the way you could do the heart rate. Like, yeah, you can't really do that if you were running with someone. Well, you could, but it kind of defeats the purpose of a group workout, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, and that's why the heart, the, but the heart rate was good here because I, if I didn't have the heart rate, I probably would have kept pushing into the slight uphill, slight headwind. And I knew that then I'd be working too hard. So I probably slowed down after, over the last sort of 90 seconds, but I knew that the effort was right. Is 170 your threshold? I reckon roughly? it's a, I reckon it's about that, yeah. So, yep. it, yeah, um, it starts to become pretty uncomfortable at that point. Um, How long is so a lap? What's a lap here? 1,800. About 18, yeah, about 1,800, yeah. Oh, that would be perfect for these kind of sessions. Yeah, it's good. Um, Gravel, flat boot. Yeah, so then on the uh, Wednesday I did my midweek long run. Uh, so I did hour 35, 407s um, through Mulligans, uh, 23.2K, uh, whacked by a magpie again, same one as a few weeks ago. Then Thursday, got out after work. Uh, this was my least enjoyable run of the week for some reason. Um, yeah, ran 11K, 420s, 
Uh, didn't feel very good, felt a bit tight through the back. Uh, Friday, I decided just to just have the day off. Um, I'm really, I don't know, like motivation's not super high. Like I'm getting out the door, I'm getting two sessions in a week, um, sort of still just trying to turn up and like waiting for things to click. Like I, I feel like my fitness is good, but I just feel like since I had pneumonia, I've just had a couple of, I feel real um, loose through my hips. If I'm, like, I just feel like I've, I've lost a bit of like hip stability and you feel re- I feel real sloppy sort of when I run. And like my long runs, for example, like I'll, I'll have a sweet spot between say 45 minutes of the run and 90 minutes of the run. And then after that, like perceived effort's not high, but my lower back starts to get a bit tight. My hip flexors start to feel like they're sort of locking up. My hamstring gets tight. Whereas before I had pneumonia, like I was running two and a half hours with no, none of those issues whatsoever. And I'm I'm finding I'm having this after like 90 minutes. So um, I think I just need to get back into just doing a bit of home gym again because I feel like I've just lost a bit of that since I got sick. Um, so anyway, I took the Friday off. Saturday I got up, and because I wasn't meeting anyone for a session, if I don't meet anyone for a session, it tends to be on the treadmill now. The treadmill is my training partner, and because I wasn't overly motive, motivated on a hard session, um, if I feel that way, I generally do a progression run because I know that if I do a progression run, it means that half to three quarters of the run I know is going to be comfortable. Um, so that's what I did. I did 10 minutes at 345s, 10 minutes at 338s, 10 minutes at 332s, and five minutes at 325s. So I got through like 9.8K in 35 minutes, so like a 334 average. Heart rate was averaging just under 160. Um, so not, not a you know super exciting session, but better than nothing. And then How Sunday, nice is progression runs oh, on the treadmill too, like yeah. just gradually ramping it up and it yep. goes so much quicker. Yeah, because the problem when you do progression runs outside is it's like you still you have to concentrate so much more on, oh, am I running too far? Am I progressing, you know, too much or not enough? Whereas, you know, you hit the up button on the treadmill and you know you're in the right area where you want to be. So, yeah. um, and I and I find like nine times out of ten, if I don't want to do a session and I do a progression run, I'll get like fifteen minutes into the session, I'm like, oh yeah, no, I'm I'm ready to I'm ready to push a bit now. It's more yeah. or just that initially, just it sort of just get you out the door to do it. Um, so yeah, it's one of my favourite runs when I'm not sort of overly motivated. Uh, yeah, and then Sunday was two hours and five minutes, thirty k, four oh nines, ran about ten k with um yeah with a guy named Jack. So that was yeah like so I wasn't yeah about fifteen minutes in. I'm like oh, it's going to be a grind, and then I sort of followed him out for about seven k, and then finally caught him, and then ran sort of ten k back with him. So that was a week of a. 115 um so it was just six six days of running and and no doubles so um yeah i said i feel like fitness is fitness is good i just need to work on a couple of um just a couple of imbalances get a bit stronger through my core and my hips and start doing maybe some strides and stuff again i've been real lazy with strides and i think even just doing some like short hill sprints or something like that might help as well do you think when you had pneumonia like all the coughing and breathing difficulties has affected your muscles through Possib- your core and your back yeah possibly and also just not moving much just pretty much being like just in bed sort of has probably tightened up my back a little bit um because before i had pneumonia i got sick with a throat infection and i missed two weeks of running but i was able to like when i started back running it was like i hadn't missed a beat um whereas yeah the, the pneumonia coming back from the, the pneumonia, pneumonia has definitely been a lot harder and i just haven't felt quite as smooth when running um but you know bodies i'm not injured and you know um just once once i start to cover the ground well then i'm, I'm sure the motivation will come back you might Let's need the a pregnancy rap. lady core program that i'm yeah, doing maybe maybe <laughs> and because that's the one thing at the start of the year when i had my sore calf and coming off covid i was actually doing a lot of like home gym stuff and when I started back, back running, I, I felt like I was moving pretty well. And then as you do, like, you know, you, you're running well, so you sort of stop doing that stuff. Um, so now is, I think, the time to start it up again. Uh, all right, Patreon shout-outs. Do you want to go first, Moose? Yeah, yep. I'm shouting out to Ollie Carroll. He's from Duncan in British Columbia in Canada. So Ollie's run 1913. 
That was in 2021 at the Cowichan Autumn Classic. 38 flat at the 2022 Cobble Hill 10K. 85-49 at the 2021 Victoria Half Marathon. Ali, what's the peak? What's the best time out of them? Half marathon, I reckon. Half marathon. Mm. Yeah, maybe. 10K is pretty good. Um, closed like a steam train for all those races. None of them were real flat too, so good chance to improve the PBs for Ollie. Yeah, I was looking at his Strava, and you know that there's those guys that always have that last one or two K that's like you know 10, 15 seconds K faster than all the other K splits in the race. So it shows there's a fair bit there in the oh, tank. Yeah. Maybe he's Basically. sandbagging. <laughs> yeah. A bit yeah. soft, you reckon, Croaks? <laughs> Maybe. Well, he comes he, he comes home strong, and, and and as I said, like none of those races were flat. Uh, I'll give a shout out to Jude Fitzgerald. Um, Jude lives in Scarborough, Queensland. Her estimated best 10K is 5831, which she did the, in the first 10K of a half marathon run leg, which was part of a relay at the Sunshine Coast 70.3 triathlon. Ran 210 at this year's Brisbane Half Marathon, owns a couple of dogs, and might be the director of health technology at Deloitte. So thanks for your support, Jude. What and sort of uh, dogs? Uh, not sure, not sure. I know that they had, they had a North, one of them had a North Queensland Cowboys uh, dog lead. <laughs> Paid so more attention the to dogs. that. Than the, I saw the you dogs saw on the a, dogs. yeah, I'm not real good with my dog breeds, but I, I recognise the North North uh, Queensland Cowboys dog lead. <laughs> there was a lot of dog training chat on the long run on Sunday, Brad. <laughs> oh, how how bad. <laughs> well, actually, I can't believe we haven't brought that up yet. What about him being the pin-up boy? For Jim's, yeah. for Jim's, for Jim's, any, look, any, I don't know, Moose, can, I might have to put the link into our show notes right. somewhere for this because. Please do. What is it, Jim's pet obedience or something? Pet, pet patrol. <laughs> pet patrol. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's he hilarious. got really shirty on Sunday when we called his e collar a shock collar. <laughs> <laughs> he got all oh. defensive. Please say. <laughs> Please don't talk about the e-collars on there. <laughs> yeah, it, was very, really it, it, it made my day, Moose, seeing that on Facebook. It was awesome. So. You know, I didn't, funny was his bag. Bag. <laughs> I didn't have to share it. I was just proud of that stay or the, the weight that, that Theo did. Uh, uh, you want to know how to stay and wait after all the money you've spent on him. <laughs> so serious too, Moose. Yeah, you, well, you, just, yeah. I've got I've only got an hour with him. Yeah, I know. I'm not going to mess around telling jokes. It's it's <laughs> we're on, mate. I walk I, over uh, there. I uh, I, I could I couldn't see Brie in the video. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't think you will see. Any of those? Oh, poor Brie. Here's your shout out to Ellie. All right, I'm going to thank Joshua Habits from Fingal in Victoria. He's got his Strava locked down pretty tightly, but he finished 17th in the 2021 64K Razorback run. So that's the one that goes from Mount Feathertop to Hotham. Uh, he might also be the managing director at Propel, which is an IT services and consulting firm. Yes. So thanks to those. Yeah, thanks to those Patreons. And, um, yeah, look, I'm not sure if we've mentioned, but, yeah, the reason why Brady is not on the show and unlikely to be on the show much over the next nine weeks is that he's doing a Road to Valencia series uh, with Christian from Norway and um, Run Strong Coaching pin-up boy Toby Mende. Um, so he's coming on one week when Moose is away. I think that's early November. But outside of that, you won't hear – about Brady's training. So he'll be doing that over there on Patreon, recording most Wednesdays. So, yeah, thanks, Patreons. And if you want to um, hear Brady's Road to Valencia recap, uh, head over there. Uh, yeah, it'll be right. interesting to see how many people tune in just for Brady. Mm. Yeah. Maybe the, um... This was a marketing ploy for your Patreon thing, wasn't it? Well, Get rid of yeah. the, best, uh, the best podcaster and put yes, him on and... Patreon only. <laughs> yes and no. So it was also the fact that I think Brady, well, before the floods, was a bit under the pump with because um, Carly's gone back to work. So 
he's working, looking after the kids two days. And so if he does the main show and then does the road to Valencia, it's, you know, it's it's a fair bit of extra work for him per week. So, um, yeah, anyway, we'll see how it see how it goes. Thanks to Mizuno for sponsoring this week's episode with their all-new Neo collection. Mizuno's most advanced floating and propulsive experiences meets our most sustainable shoes ever. Packed full of iconic Mizuno technology such as Mizuno Energy and Mizuno Wave Plate for the ultimate smooth ride. Plus 60% of the Wave Neo Wind and 70% of the Wave Neo Ultra are made from eco-friendly materials by weight. So you can run without compromise. Be sure to check out all the latest updates from Mizuno at mizuno.com.au or you can find them in selected stores. Um, all right, running news. Not a lot this week. Do you want to take us to Amsterdam, Moose? Yeah, so I I didn't actually watch this one. Normally I do watch Amsterdam. I normally like to check it out. It goes out along a river. Um, it's obviously not the A-grade race in Europe. It's part of like that B-grade kind of series. Um it's still really fast. I mean, they're running the winner to Sege Geta Chu, who's been around a fair bit. He's run 204.49 for the win. Um, he's, he's sort of, it looks like he's been in a sprint finish with Titus Kipruto, who ran 204.54, and Bazez U Asmare for 204.56. So, pretty tight finish in the men's. I'm not sure. Did you guys watch it? No, I didn't see much at all. Um, and even the um, – I did download the app, and even the app was hard to follow. It seemed to be, um, like, really big delays. Like, I was following Kieran Perkins, the Aussie guy, and, uh, you know, it would take ages for it to go from, like, his 21K split to then, like, the 25K split. So it was, yeah, pretty hard to follow even on, even online, just getting splits. Yeah, I so- watched the live stream, but I missed the – I missed a fair bit of it. I only saw the end. Um, and it was all in Dutch, so I couldn't really <laughs> understand what was going on. It wasn't on Flow Track or anything? No, it was on the app. They had a live stream, but um, oh. you had to have a like a Netherlands VPN. Oh, yeah. yeah. To get it to play. Um, mm. Kieran Perkins, though, on the men's side, the milkman, he's one of our <laughs> favourites here. He ran 217.52. For 29th, um, is that a debut? No, it's his second. So he did he did Sunshine Coast um, a few years back and like blew up pretty bad. Um, okay. But since then, he's improved like his like all of his distance. Like as you as you know, like early on in the year, like he won the um, he won the New South Wales uh, Sydney 10. Um, he did well in a couple of the other road races before he headed overseas for work. So he's with the Defence Force. Yeah, uh, so, so I think he's been spending a fair bit of time in around like Dubai area recently. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm not sure what his training's like, but yeah, so 217.52, it's obviously like about a 10 minute improvement, I think. Um, but what I'm did sure. Did he go through halfway in, Brad? I wonder if he ran with the girls. Pat. Yeah, yeah, he did. So he was pretty much bang on, and, and um, the yeah the Ayana ran away from him, I guess, in the last couple of k. But but yeah, so the women there was two big debuts to watch: Almaz Ayana, the women's 10k champ from Rio, and Genzibi Dibaba, who is part of the Dibaba sisters clan of mm. elite distance runners, like all time. Fifteen hundred meter world record holder. Is she yeah, still? she is. Yeah, yep. Yeah, well, she's like one of the goats in the 5k, really, isn't she? As well, is that her in the 5k? Yeah, she did. It. She's got some good five k times. She doesn't have the record though. Um, no, not the Gide's record. But she won a, didn't she win a lot of medals in the five k? Oh, was well, that she a was sister? More of a yeah, rather. yeah, a sister. Yeah. <laughs> Tiranesh, Tir- is that Tiranesh Tiranesh? The barber, Yeah. So okay. Tiranesh, I think, was the one that won a lot of the medals over the, like the five k. Um, yeah. So Tiranesh de Barba was a three time Olympic champion, five time world champion, um, three time Olympic. Five- Bronze medalist. Um, let me have a look. But yeah, uh, so anyway. that's a pretty uh, <laughs> her uh, range. So two eighteen marathon and what three fifty or something has she run for the fifteen hundred? Yeah, yeah. Fifteen hundred runners that come from aerobic backgrounds, like they're still excellent distance runners, aren't they? Like I know it's I know it's different, but 
you've got some pedigree there. I mean, if you if you're an 800, one of the 800 style 1500 runners who sort of get through on big power, um, maybe you don't stretch it to the marathon. But I mean, you look at someone like Stewie, who's who's our who's our record holder. Or did Ollie Hall break his record? No, Stewie's still the record yeah, holder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he, you know, like he can run. He's got some range on him, obviously, and you can see him doing well on the roads in the future. But anyway, Elmaz Ayana, she actually won in two seventeen twenty, so the fastest ever debut um, from a, a lady. And yeah, she, was that a that was obviously men's paste. Yeah, right? yeah, they all started yeah, together. They yeah. together. Yeah. So how are we calling this fastest debut? Men's paced because you know they won't give a world record to that anymore. Well, well the world record then, is yeah. now the world record was run with the men as well, so it's two fourteen. Bridget Cosgo, that was in Chicago, so that was with men yeah. too. So they so have a women's only world London, record right? as well. Pardon? Yeah, like the London like to to uh, talk about that, don't they? London, yeah, London Marathon are like. Uh, they they have women's only and so they they play that up. Yeah. Yeah. They no, went, it wasn't London. It's not London. I think it was London no, that because, did because they had um oh, someone yeah. ran was it Mary Katani maybe ran the women's only world record yeah. once they started calling it that. Yes, that's right. Cuz is it yeah. what do you think about that sense. Ellie? Oh. Uh, I think it's stupid because there's hardly any races that are women's only. I think they should just – I know it's unfair to the guys because they don't have people that can pace them. Around that, but then that would never work because they'd still be – in a mixed race, there'd still be sneaky pacing happening, I reckon, even if they made it a rule that they could only have men pacing them to 30K or whatever. Um, but, yeah, I think just don't worry about it and just call it the fastest time, the world record. I agree. Because what is it? It's Lon- London and New York are really the only majors where the women go on their own. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah and New York's and New York's not like a world record course. So. Yeah. And then there's events like Nagoya, I guess, which is a women's only race. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's so like there's hardly any, so it sort of seems stupid to. Yeah, I guess there's the really championship it. races too, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it just seems pointless. To you still have, worry you still about have to, it. yeah, you still have to run it. Like you can have a pacer, but they don't, you know, you can't jump on their back and then carry you. You still have to run the distance. So, and it's not like cycling where there's a massive drafting effect. So, yeah, I reckon yeah. they should just have the one, the one record book. Yep. Yeah. Um, there was a third place finisher, Sihei Gemetsu, who ran two eighteen fifty nine. So, Amsterdam, pretty good event. Get some fast runners. Three guys under two oh five. That's pretty epic. Yeah, yeah. That's, and then I watched that race in the past and thought this is not a, a very fast place to run. Um, in my mind, like running down footpaths and stuff. Mm. But obviously, you can get it done. Well, it Millie it Clark. Is just Millie, so Millie, Millie flat. Yeah. Is, that the, is that the one where Millie Millie Clark had a bit of a breakthrough run there? I think. Yeah, was that when she? Maybe when she ran two twenty nine. Yeah, I think so. To yeah. make the Olympics, was it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I know um, who was it? Chris Hamer ran there as well. I think he ran two thirteen or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would have been the one that I would have, if I was Christian, I would have gone and done that. Oh, really? well, we have to wait yeah. wait till Valencia now. Yeah. Uh, all right, the only other bit of running news which I put in here, which is not something that we normally talk about, but um, Ned Brockman has been the talk of the town the last, well, definitely today, but the last few weeks. So uh, Ned ran from Cottesloe Beach over in Western Australia to Bondi Beach um, to raise money for Mobilise, which is a charity that's aimed at decreasing homelessness. So 9,000, about, yeah, nine, oh, sorry, 3,950 kilometres in 47 days. So an average of about 84 kilometres per day. So um, pretty amazing. How many days do you reckon you could do that for? 100 kilometres. Well, <laughs> so he averaged, he averaged 84. Um, obviously, like, he, like you know, he, he travels 84 kilometres a day because there's times when he walks, um, stops for massages, um 
but like yeah in terms of just the wear and tear on the body like I, I think the issue i would have was just running like six minute like learning to run six minute k's which is sort of what the pace that they those guys do for that period of time um yeah you would have trouble with that <laughs> oh yeah yeah so but that's pretty pretty cool but imagine think about how your body feels up the day after a marathon imagine just yeah, day after day after day doing that twice he's yeah. essentially done 84k a day you should have seen Pretty the people amazing. at Bondi Beach this afternoon when he came in. It's like thousands. Yeah, I did. Yeah, see I saw a, um, a video. Pretty crazy. Yeah. It was pretty cool, actually, how uh, everybody got around it. Like, even the general public seemed to be able to understand how amazing that was running that far each day. And I think he had like a lot of support, I guess, from um, some, you know, footballers and well known mm. sports people that seemed to. Yeah, get him lots of attention. So that was good. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it was pretty crazy early on when he was getting the injuries he was getting. Oh, I'm not yeah. sure. He probably had injuries later on too, but he had a really bad one where he had to actually – maybe he even missed a day of running or something. Um, yeah, I think, he had to, I think he had a couple of days where he just ran – did 40K and then yeah, – because he was going off for MRIs and it, it didn't look good at that stage, did it? I know we were, we were sending some messages saying, you know, you know he – he may have cooked it early. Um, yeah. And wasn't that only like 12 days in or 10 yeah. days in or something? And that's the thing. Yeah. It's like as, as we know as runners, like injuries don't just disappear. Like you don't just go, oh, I'm going to take two days off now, go and get an MRI, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm good to go back to 100K the next day. So it, you'd imagine that he would have been running in a fair amount of discomfort from the time that he had those significant injuries from day 12. Yeah. 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 And, and that's yeah. like have you guys been following Akana? Mm. as well yeah, yeah. Murray Bartlett. Uh, so she's doing a marathon every day and I think she she had some calf issues fairly uh, early on too and it's just it's amazing that the human body can heal it just goes to show doesn't it how yeah how amazing our bodies are that you can have something like that still run a marathon day after day and it imp- it imp- can improve yeah 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 I would hate I mean there's got to be some mornings where you're getting up going oh boy that's <laughs> I don't want to be doing this today. Oh, yeah. All right, Moose, your favourite time of the show. We're about to review a couple of pairs of shoes. So thanks to Mizuno for sending us these shoes. Uh, what are we reviewing tonight? Mate, we've got a couple of shoes from the Neo collection. So the Neo collection is – it's not like a um, – well, it's kind of like an innovation sort of project for – Mizuno, where they put their, their newer foams, their sort of more energized type of foams that breaks away from their traditional um, core range. So the core range for, for Mizuno sort of looks like Rider, or Wave Rider, Wave Sky, Wave Inspire, Wave Horizon. And um, that's that's what a lot of people will recognize those names because they're the, the big four from the brand. But the Wave Neo Ultra and the Wave uh neo bin it used yeah. to be i think it was it had a previous name this is sort of a newer name um they're the two shoes we got uh they do look quite different from mizuno um they feel different and yeah they uh you've spent a bit of time in them yeah so let's let, let's run through them one by one so let's start with the wave neo ultra which is their bigger more cushioned training shoe yeah and this is brady's favorite and <laughs> Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame that he's not here tonight because I haven't seen him froth this much about shoes that we've been given in the past. Um, so we do have a few comments from Brady, which we'll read out shortly. But, yeah, take us through the specs of, uh, yeah, the Wave Neo Ultra. Yeah, well, him frothing on a shoe, I was thinking about this before. It's like uh, someone who goes to a local pub and there's one beer on tap, Carlton Draft, and they swap it out for VB, and all of a sudden the, the bloke's like going, whoa, this is amazing, this new beer in town. <laughs> I always sort of feel like you blokes are just like starved of choice um, whenever you get a shoe. It's, uh, but, no, this one here, uh, this, is the, this is a highly cushioned training shoe for mileage. It has, well, I'll, I'll just run through kind of like the, um, I guess, the, the, the specs maybe like mm-hmm. the specs being uh the, the stuff we can measure <laughs> yeah. um so it's a 300 gram trainer 
that's normally taken from a men's nine. So it's pretty heavy in terms of um, some of the other trainers out there these days. Like I think of Saucony Triumphs, is, which this would kind of compete with is about 265 grams. Um, but you do get more cushion. So it's 39 mil in the heel, which is a fair bit. 31 up front, that's 8 mil drop, which is a little bit less for Mizuno. Mizuno has always been quite high with their pitch heights, um, pretty conservative in that regard. Uh, so this is sort of, I guess, comes along that, that innovative um, type play. Um, they've gone from having plastic plates in their, sh in their shoe. They're definitely softening their plates up throughout their range. Um, this one has a, a foam wave plate. So it, it's, it, it runs through the shoe. It's made of foam now instead of plastic. Still gives it a bit of sort of rigidity and a bit of flow underfoot. Um, now, Mizuno Energy is the, the foam they use, and you can find it in a couple of their models in the range at the moment in sort of like a, uh, like a core part of the shoe, and then it's surrounded by other foam. So a shoe like the um, Mizuno Wave Sky has it. Uh, I think the Horizon has it as well. But this shoe is made all of Mizuno Energy, and they've broken that foam into three sort of different um, variations. So mm -hmm. Mizuno Energy Core is in the rear foot and forefoot, so that's the real soft one. Energy Light is the, the, the higher bounce back stuff, and Energy is the durable, like the firmer piece. So there's three foams. They're all sort of one of them's more stable, less poppy. One of them is real poppy and, and um, the other one's quite light. So, yeah, three foams underfoot. There's a fair bit going on. The, the knit, it's, a, it's a knitted upper. So this, is, um, this suits some people. Others don't like it. Others prefer mesh. Uh, the, the knit is uh, over time stretches to sort of the shape of the foot a little bit more than mesh does. Uh, it's quite durable in terms of like it, it doesn't really tear or, or your toes don't pop, pop through that often. Um, it can feel a little bit more sock-like, especially around the heel. It's got, got kind of like a booty style around the heel, um, and it's sustainable. So sustainable, every shoe company is going for it. This one here, probably a little bit more than most. Uh, this is like... 60 to 70%. So 70% so of the Ultra um, is made from eco-friendly materials and 60% of the Neo Wind. Yeah, yeah. And like... They call out little bits and pieces, like the sock line. The sock liner, part of the sock liner, is made from algae, um, which, yeah, I mean, the sock liner is, is the inner sole, basically. Uh, so it's not a big part of the shoe, but every little bit counts, croaks. Yeah. Yeah. So I've enjoyed this. I use this now for my either midweek long run or long run shoe. So that's what I'll be using. Um, I love the cushion in it. Uh, there's probably only been one other shoe. So the shoe that I've been doing my long runs in before I got this, I'll just basically alternate with that now. Um, you said it's, it's heavier, but like I, I did one of my midweek long runs, like 22K at 403s in this thing um, on, the, on the bike path. So I was able to get rolling. Uh, one thing I also like about the Mizuno shoes in general is how durable the outer or the outer sole is. Um, I know when we got given the Wave Rider, um, and we'll talk about the Neo Win shortly, but the outer sole for the Neo Win is very similar to that, and it, it's quite a dur it's quite durable compared to some of the other shoe companies. So and yeah, um, yeah. yeah. that can be yeah. where the weight comes in too. So the outer sole is the heaviest part of a shoe, and if you're gonna add a more sort of higher density durable outer sole, you're gonna add weight. That's mm. just a that's just a trade off. And this shoe is not that cheap. It's three hundred and twenty dollars, and so I think you want a high quality out of sole on a, a shoe that you pay, a training shoe that you pay that much for. I think yeah. if you're going to drop three twenty on a race shoe, you're buying it for performance. But mm -hmm. if you're if you're paying three twenty for a training shoe, durability should be a big part of that equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, this will be my rotation. As I said, uh, midweek long runs and long runs. Uh, a couple of comments here from Brady. He said, I reckon it's the real deal, easy jogging shoe that's an alternative for the Nike Invincible. I enjoy it for second runs of the day when legs are a bit beat up and gives plenty of cushion. Uh, he also liked the sock feel for both this one and the Neo Wind. So um, should we move on to the Neo Wind? Yeah, go for it. So uh, the, the Neo Wind, yeah, I'll run you through the specs again because that's 
that's my job. Facts. <laughs> Shoot on. <laughs> well, uh, this is 255 grams. So you've dropped 45 grams um, and you've dropped a fair bit of cushion. So this, this type of shoe is aimed in the category of, at the moment, we talk about sort of Nike Pegasus Turbo. We might, we might be thinking um, Asics Nova Blast, the Hocker Mac 5, that, that area of the wall, uh, maybe New Balance Rebel type areas. So lightweight trainer. Um, it's still made of energy. Uh, it's 12 mil drop heel to toe. So this one here is traditional New Balance. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the thinking is behind that. To be honest, why we they would go with a higher offset for their lightweight trainer, but lower offset for their more cushioned shoe. It, it that doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, the height it's less foam, so 36 and a half at the back, 24 and a half up front, um, and you can feel that there's less shoe underfoot here mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, still got the sort of weight the um, foam wave. And this one here is Energy Light Top Sole. So that's like the lighter weight foam and Energy, the more stable Energy at the back. So for a rear foot strike. Um, still the net upper and the outer sole is probably a little, so I guess maybe a little bit um, stickier than the, the previous shoe underfoot, but less of it. So the lugs are maybe a little bit thinner and um, a bit lighter perhaps in terms of the outer sole because that's what they're going for. Yeah, so for me, this one, I've worn it a couple of times, um, but in terms of my rotation, like I wore it today, so it's going like on a Monday, so it would be a, a shoe that I wear on a slightly shorter run where I plan to do some strides afterwards. So like one thing I, because, you know, in the last few years, like so many of the shoes that I've been wearing have had so much more cushion, a bit more stack height, a bit more shoe there. So when you go to do strides in those sort of, slightly heavier slightly more cushioned um higher stack height shoes it feels a bit clunky like there's just too much under your foot whereas this shoe here it's light enough that i can you know do my 45 minute to an hour run but then i can feel the ground under me when i want to do those strides which you sort of want that feel a bit bit more of an old school sort of racing flat feel um but it's got enough sort of cushion there for those hour runs so that's that's where it fits in my rotation as i said the the outer sole it's a bit similar to the wave rider um and i reckon i go about i don't know 800 k's maybe in the last wave rider and and the outer sole still look pretty good um yeah. Bra- brady said that he ran 25k straight out of the box uh and yeah and it was a nice lightweight trainer and once again like like the sock feel yeah, and you mentioned Mizuno Rider, Wave Rider. Um, that that shoe dropped, I'm going to say it was early last week uh, into our store or maybe late the week before, and it's probably been the biggest, um, like, release of a shoe. Not the biggest release of a shoe, but the, the, the most immediate change or uptake in sales compared to the previous version. And, and we weren't really considering that um, or planning on it. But I remember seeing it and I thought, yeah, this is probably about eight months ago, saw the shoe and thought, this looks really good. We're going to do multiple colours, a couple of widths of this. And it's come in and the staff can't, can't not sell it at the moment. What like, is it? Is it the, is it the colour scheme? Is it the – it feels comfortable when people first put it on? What, what's yeah, the customer it's, feedback? It, it's, it's a little bit more volume through the forefoot it's softer and it's really smooth underfoot so it's still stable but the smoothness like the the transition from foot strike to toe off that's where shoes get sold in our store because people get to try them on the treddy uh they we they can take them outside if they want but we sell a lot on comfort and ride and this shoe it it competes with nearly anything in the in the store in its category and we're seeing that reflected in in sales as well we we were chatting off air, Maris, about how Mizuno have really sort of stepped up, you know, from five years ago, like, you know, the three shoes that we've spoken about tonight, but there's a racing flat that is being released uh, uh, in January 2023, and we've been lucky enough to receive a pair, and all three of us have been super impressed with that shoe. We can't obviously talk about it, 
Um, but, you know, I, I think that's going to be a big seller next year. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I'm quite happy to admit that I was a bit sceptical when I put it on and for the, just standing around in it and even looking at it, like we are getting it in the store. But at the time, I, I kind of did it thinking, I don't know about this. Like, <laughs> this is- yeah, because that, 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 that's where the whole like VB Carlton thing came because both Brady and I messaged you straight away because I got home from work, put it on, ran down my hallway, which is about 30 meters long. And I was like, oh my God, I have not felt a shoe like this since like the Alpha Fly. And um, message you and, and Brady sort of said the same thing. And you're like, oh, you boys. And then you've put it on. You've, you've definitely changed your tune since yeah, wearing yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Oh, absolutely. Like, it was too small the first one for me. So I, they actually swapped, well, they sent me a, a half size bigger. And so I've done two workouts, one in the small size, one in the big size. And um, after I got back, I put on all my other super shoes next to it. And I'm like, fuck, this feels the best. Mm. Like, out of all of them, this is the shoe that gives me the most amount of return out of any shoe. Um, and there's other little facts. Like, we can't really talk about too much. We've sort of been told not to. So we've probably done it, done enough already, Croaks. Yeah. But, um, watch, watch this space. Exactly. <laughs> all right, Moose. Well, I reckon we've done all right there. So thanks again to Mizuno for sponsoring the show and sending us those shoes. Yeah, cheers. It's yeah, good to see a small, like, they're not a small brand, but, you know, a runner's brand stepping up like that. All right. Listen to question. Uh, loved Moose's talk about his goals for training in today's episode. So this was from, like, episode 209, so it's a while ago. Uh, you talked about training as a 218 marathoner or at current fitness, but how does he slash you suggest training to improve performances? I've gone 252, 252, and 251 in my last three marathons and would like to – uh, like to get sub 245. Should I carry on training like a 250-ish marathoner, expecting improvement, or push myself to improve and train for 245, or have I missed the point? And that question comes in from Sean. What do we think, Moose? I, I actually missed that. Sorry, mate. Which one oh. was it? My, my headphones messed up. Ali, you answer it, and then I'll um, work out what question it is. <laughs> All right. So I guess it, it probably depends a little bit. Is he, like, are they his first three marathons? Because if they're his first three marathons, he's probably still got a lot of the improvement um, anyway if he keeps ticking along. But if he's if he's training uh, to set paces for all of his races, like maybe that's not the thing you should be so, so focused on and maybe getting to that sub 245 is a case of adding some more mileage or – adjusting the types of sessions he's doing a little bit, looking at the structure of his week and making some changes there. Cause I don't think the answer is to really go, right. Oh, I want to run 245. So mm. everything I've been doing at 250 pace, I just need to do them all at 245 pace. That's, you know, generally not the way to, to do it. So yeah, he, I mean, he'd probably want to just have a look at his training as a whole. And it, often with the marathon, if you can tolerate more mileage and you can fit it into your week around your work and family and whatever else you have going on, that can be the thing that just gives you some extra time without actually having to change anything else. Yeah, look, I, I agree. I think the most important thing is that you train to your current fitness as opposed to chasing chasing certain times because if you um, yeah, if you train to where you want to be instead of where you are, then you're more likely to overtrain. Um, also like fitness, like you might start a marathon block and you know, your current fitness might be 250, but as you get fitter throughout a block, your training paces might actually come down to the point where you are like, you know, ready to race at 247 and that might be your next step. And then you start your next block and you're training, you're training as a 247, um, marathoner by the end of that next block, you're, you're capable of running 245. Yeah. Yeah. It's a trap to reach out and um just basically put a number there because you want to not because it's justified i I made a massive mistake trying to run 220 before i was capable of it uh one time in particular i could get the workouts done at the paces prescribed which was 220 pace marathon pace but it was at (laughs) it was like 
I was starting to get anxious about these workouts because of how difficult they were. And I was going to the well twice a week, every single week. Um, And if you can do 10 mile tempo, like at a certain pace, just because um, you can do that doesn't mean that that's the pace that is marathon pace. And and I think it, that's what a lot of people get caught in that trap. Yeah, and it's not. And you get. Uh, sorry, you go, Ellie. Oh, I was just going to say, you get to learn those that different effort level, don't you? The more blocks you do, and you know, like, oh yeah, I am reaching here to mm. hit that compared to this is really comfortable. I'm actually having to pull myself back slightly to stay on this pace, and I reckon that's often the sweet spot. Mm. And yep. it happens as well for people training for shorter distances. Like they'll go out to they'll go out to do sessions with this preconceived idea that I want to hit say three ten for my K reps when their current fitness they should be hitting three fifteens. And like that five seconds is a, is a big difference in terms of you know overreaching. So yeah, train to like, we'll train to current fitness or even you know like Sean Crichton's the perfect example. He often trains under where his current fitness really is. And then still still um, gets fit by doing that and then races at a higher level than what his training indicates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's It comes down to confidence, doesn't it? A yeah. confident person will be comfortable doing that and an insecure person will have to see the paces in training. Mm. Um, yeah. It, for, it, for the kudos. It, yeah, and even for their own mind, just – knowing that it's there on paper that they've done it that they can get like justify in their head that they can do it even though deep down they probably realize they can't because the workout was so hard all right moose i think we answered that all right um you got a moose on the loose this week well i've sort of already gone into the monophyte like moose on the loose but i thought we'd throw out a challenge for people this month We'll call it the month of November. We'll include the next six weeks. Whenever someone does a monophyllic on Strava, make sure you go into their reps and look at the differences to make sure they're not doing a tempo run, especially at the end. Because no one likes cheating the monophyllic. Because that's what we call it at the end, <laughs> cheating the mono. And so, what's, so what's the difference need to be in pace? Oh, there like, needs to be a difference for one. Has to be yeah. a difference. And I reckon at least five to ten seconds a K. I reckon, even to, I reckon, I reckon more than that. I reckon it needs to be more than that. Like, yeah. Because if, if you think about like it's it's a similar session in a way to Deke's quarters. And I always work on the floats probably between 20 and 30 seconds a K slower than the rep pace. Yeah. Well, yeah, yes. I that, agree. Yeah. I've spent too much time in Ballarat where it's more like we're doing a mono we're doing a mono tempo tonight, which is a lap a lap of the lake time trial. Yeah, because if you think about it, if you're doing three minutes for reps and three ten for floats, like that, that's that's not a big difference at all. Like when you over like a minute rep. Whereas, okay, let's do it there. Yeah, then. I think it should be I think it should be at least twenty seconds. Okay, good, very good. Um. All right, what's coming up? So this weekend there's Bernie 10K. I uh, saw the Elite Fields were released last week, so I think Sinead's having a run down there. Um, and then, yeah, Road to Valencia will be on Patreon. Uh, Brady wanted us to let you know that they're recording late Thursday night, so it'll be out Thursday night or Friday morning, so keep your eye out over there. Um, what do you got coming up, Ellie, in the next few weeks? Uh not too much just keep building up the k's and we've got a wedding this weekend matt gunther friend of the show yeah saturday so that'll be fun we'll do a long run saturday i'd say no we won't you're doing your long run saturday (laughs) just of course i'm not you do the crime you do the time Uh, sundays are for long runs that's rough moose no, I don't reckon there'll be too many Surf Coast Track Club people long running on Sunday. Just quietly, I reckon there's a few Saturday plans already. You know who would long run Sunday? Toby <laughs> Menday. Toby Menday would. That's true. Toby Menday, my man. See? <laughs> Damn it, I'm going to have to long run Sunday. <laughs> Toby would do 44Ks on Sunday over hills too. 
<laughs> well, Ellie, we, we might um because Brady, I don't think he's back until what early December. We might try and get you on, you know, towards the end or maybe end of November, early December, so we can get another update on how the fitness is progressing. If if that's all right with you. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, See cool. if I'm injured yet. <laughs> Hopefully not. You won't be. You'll be you'll be number one. You'll be, you'll be Moose's favourite by then. He's not winning races by then. <laughs> Toby will be injured after the training that Jules has been making oh, him do. Well, actually, what we'll do is we'll get you on what would be Monday the 5th of December because we'll be able to recap the Valencia race. So you'll be able yeah, to cool. recap Toby's run and um, see where you're positioned on the pecking order. Mm. <laughs> Brady good. will be dirty. He's not on that day, surely. Was it that? Oh, no, because they'll but, still be over in Valencia. So we'll record the day oh, that's after. that's true. Yeah, we'll record yeah, yeah. the day after Yeah, they'll Valencia. probably want to do a recap one too, yeah. won't they? Yeah. So, and what about you, Moose? Wedding? Anything else exciting happening? No, just a wedding. That's a pretty big deal at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, can't wait. All right. Well, I think that's it for tonight. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back again next week with another guest host, um, another big name, and then uh, yeah. All right. See you guys next week. Yeah, See good. you guys. See ya. Thanks, Ali. No worries. Bye. This week's episode of the Inside Running Podcast was sponsored by Mizuno. Be sure to check out the all-new eco performance range from Mizuno, the Wave Neo Collection, at mizuno.com.au or you can find them in selected stores. Oh,